Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be talking about the rocketry program that he's been working on mm -hmm. with several of our former students right. and current students. Yes. Okay. Also great. current ones. Well, great. Without further ado, Dr. Durienzo. Well, thank you all for coming. Oh, yes. Clap for me. Yes. Thank you for coming. So great to see so many of my students coming here for extra credit and even some people I didn't bribe to come here. So thank you all for coming. Um, so it's been probably three years since I did my last speaker series talk, I got roped into one, I think my very first semester where I actually talk about my research. So as an astrophysicist, my specialty is actually in studying massive star formation. So where big massive stars come from, how they form. And I use a lot of radio astronomy and infrared astronomy and study different nebulas around the Milky Way. I'm pretty much not gonna talk about any of that today. All right, so what I wanna talk about instead is some of the rocketry programs that we've had uh, going on here at Sheboygan and that I've done with some students. So there's really uh, two and a half sort of different projects that have been going on over the past uh, year-ish or so um, that we're gonna try and keep going on here at campus. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we actually uh, do with these. So feel free to tell any of your friends about these opportunities that we have, okay? So I just titled it simply enough, Rocketry. Um, so up here is a picture of me with some of the students uh, that worked on one of the rocket programs this past year. Um, their names and many of the other names who had anything to do whatsoever uh, with the projects are, are pretty much all down here, along with a couple of our other um, staff that work, work here or worked here, Guy Campbell and Stephanie Evanson. And on the left-hand side there is a completed payload for our, uh, sort of our, our crown jewel Rocksat C rocket payload that I'll be talking about as well. And I'll tell you about some of these things I have out on the table as we go along here. But the first thing I wanna actually talk about is the Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium. Uh, so who here has ever actually heard of this? Great, quite a few of you, okay? So just filling you in in case you haven't or in case you have some incomplete or incorrect information if you have heard of it, uh, NASA disperses most of its education and outreach, outreach funds through Space Grant Consortia. There are 52 of them, so every state, DC and Puerto Rico each has one. And the consortium members are largely universities and colleges, plus some industry partners and some other um, non-for-profit partners as well. So Wisconsin actually being sort of a middling state in terms of population, uh, actually has a huge consortium with a relatively large number of members. I think I heard at one point we had the second most members of any state consortium, which is crazy. Um, and we have a lot of very active programs. Uh, I remember I once was looking up uh, Maryland Space Grant Consortium programs for somebody who was from Maryland and I was, telling them, oh, you know, Space Grant Consortium has so many programs, and I think I saw two things on their website. So we're in a pretty active one with a lot of different programs. I'm gonna tell you about a couple of them. Uh, but basically what, what this means is that a, as a consortium member that we are, UW-Sheboygan, uh, all of our students are able to apply for their various scholarships and fellowships and can take uh, part in a lot of their different programs where they fund different activities like some of the rocket programs I'm gonna talk about, okay? Uh, it also means that our faculty and staff are able to apply for money for research funds or outreach or education funds. And so I keep trying to push these things on people so I'm not the only one applying for things all the time. Um, but it's a, a pretty good way to get sort of small to maybe medium-ish sized grants to support projects um, and to try things out. Um, so I took this screenshot of their website from a little while ago uh, where the big uh, news item still up there was the rocket winners from last year. Uh, being announced, the Collegiate Rocket Launch, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about where our team fell and the results for that. Uh, but if anybody would like to know more about these programs, I always post a bunch of stuff on the bulletin board outside the Wombat Room here, and I've actually got a big pile of things I'll be updating for the new school year, and uh, feel free to take my business cards on the way out if you have any questions about this or anything else that I talk about as well, okay? And I want to especially push all of you students to think about trying to apply for something, one of their scholarships or something else this year, um, because it's really not as competitive as you think. And when they say that you have to be working in space science or supporting NASA's mission in some way 
to be uh, eligible to apply, that can be very, very, very broad. All right, we've had a lot of biologists and chemists apply for things because they can find a way to relate it back to human space flight. Okay, so just about anybody can, can get involved. Um, so with that being said, one of the big programs that Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium does is this collegiate rocket launch. So this is our team of four students from last year. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Ian, Chelsea, Robert, and Martha. Some of you might recognize them if you were here before, okay. Um, Ian is the one who is basically spearheading our uh, initiative in the Collegiate Rocket Launch uh, this year going forward. They already had their first big organizational meeting today, you know, a whole three weeks before Space Grant Consortium has their first meeting. So we're actually ahead of the schedule for once on something. Um, and so basically what this Collegiate Rocket Launch program is, is that every uh, school in the consortium that can field the team, and this year I think we even had some schools that fielded two teams because they had enough student interest, uh, they put together uh, it's teams of four to six students, and over the course of the year, so roughly from October to April, build a rocket, a model rocket, but not like a tiny little one like you would build from a kit at a hobby shop, um, but sort of a semi-custom-made rocket about yay big. All right, so this is the one that they actually ended up flying, seen in that picture right up there. So this thing is you know five, six feet tall, all right, um, and there's a lot of different uh, uh, freedoms that they have in their actual design. When you do this kind of rocket, there are a lot of sort of prefab parts like standard tube sizes, but you get to pick which one of those you use and what engine you use and things like that. Um, and this competition has a whole bunch of different parts to it. The main part, of course, being the launch. And I said this was not just your standard little kit. The target altitude for these launches is 3,000 feet. All right, so that's over half a mile up. So this is not a tiny little rocket that you can just fire off in the backyard. Okay. That is actually one of the first steps of the competition, is to launch a tiny little rocket and take pictures of it so that they know you can do at least that much. Um, so at some point here in the fall, you're gonna be seeing uh, this year's rocket team launch one or more rockets probably on the ground somewhere. Last year, we just did it kind of over on the soccer fields and luckily it went over the PE building and didn't land on the roof. Uh, this year, they're talking about getting a whole bunch to test out some, some things for their bigger rocket. So I think we're going to announce at some point like a big rocket launch day that everybody can come and see what they're going to do. Last I heard, the plan was to do 24 little ones. So we'll see if that turns out or, or not. Uh, but that should be pretty fun. Uh, so anyway, the, the big part of the competition is trying to hit that target altitude, right? So you lose points not only if you're too low, but if you go too high. So it's not just a how high can you get sort of competition, okay? Uh, but there are several other pieces to it too. So for example, the team had to write a preliminary report and a final design report. Um, they had to do an outreach component, so I took them to Oostburg High School and we talked to some of the physics classes there about some of these programs. And they have to do a presentation the night before the launch as well, where they talk about a lot of their design choices. Um, in addition to all of that, every year there's a different challenge that goes along with the competition, okay? So last year's challenge was to generate electricity during rocket flight. So you had to generate it so you couldn't just have a battery and let it go, okay? And it couldn't be something that was just running continuously from before launch. It had to be something that in some way turned on during launch. And then you measure either a voltage or a current. They were pretty lax about how you actually measured it. Didn't have to actually power anything. You just had to get a measurement of something, okay? Um, so this is what the team decided to go with last year. Um, what I think is a pretty simple, elegant design. It's basically this thing. It used four what are called Peltier plates. Has anybody ever heard of those before? So a Peltier plate is one of these, these white things that you see here along the edge, okay? Uh, and basically, if you apply a temperature difference, so it's hotter on one side than the other, it generates a little bit of voltage, okay? Um, and so what they did is that they machined out this aluminum block that goes in this fin section so that the actual motor of the rocket, which is basically a big firework, sticks up through the hole. The end of it sticks up through here, right? This is the cap that kind of screws it all in place. So when the motor goes off and it gets hot and hotter on the inside than the outside, helped out a little bit by these shaved down heat sinks to try and keep it cooler on the outside as much as possible, it generated a little bit of voltage. And stacking them up in series, they got measurements, I think, peaking at around half a volts, typically more sustained around a few millivolts or so. And so that was enough for the competition, all right? So I'm actually, I'll pass this around if you guys wanna take a look at it. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna pass around most of these things. There's a lot of scary looking wires. Um, 
it's harder to break than you think, and pretty much all these things are becoming museum pieces, except we might scrounge the, the model rocket for parts at some point. So it's not terrible if you break anything. There's actually nothing super expensive in terms of parts on any of these, so don't feel bad if you do break something else. Just let me know. Okay. Um, what do you guys think some of the other teams did? Anybody have any ideas? What would you do if you were trying to generate electricity on a rocket? Did I hear a mumble somewhere? Okay, well, you're a historian, so I wouldn't expect you to. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, historically, how did people generate power? Come on. I know there are at least a couple of students from my physics class who are thinking about doing something in the STEM field, so I hope you guys have some idea. Somebody give me at least one other idea. Some kind of wind power, yeah. I would say a good number of the teams tried to do some kind of wind power, okay? I think there was one other team that did something like this. And a handful of teams out of the 13, I think it was, in the total competition that did some form of wind. So a couple of them tried to attach something just onto the side here, so a little lateral sort of spinning thing, generate some, some electricity, okay? And of course, the issue potentially with that is that you have some extra drag because you have this thing sticking off of the rocket and pot potential weight issues because it's a little imbalanced, right? So what did some of the other teams who wanted to do a turbine did? They basically machined little air intakes around their tube and put their fan in the body of their tube to make it work. And these are both things that our team considered and they got away from. All right, so the first one, they didn't want to worry about the drag or balance issues. The second one, super worried that the rocket would tear itself apart during launch. Okay, I went to the launch last year in April. We had two rockets basically disintegrate during launch. One of them, the motor just ripped apart the rocket, went through and still went straight up. The other one went to the side, spiraling towards a bunch of people, and luckily hit a picnic table in front of where most people were sitting. But the rocket, was, rocket engine was still firing when it hit the picnic table. So this is, again, not just little backyard model rockets, right? There is actual safety concerns. Everyone has to stop and look at the rocket when it launches, and you have to keep watching it until the parachute comes out to be safe. This past year, in, in this April, we didn't have any rockets fall apart during launch, but what we did have is two of them where the parachutes didn't come out, and so they came down pointy metal nose first from thousands of feet in the air, bury halfway into the ground. Did I mention part of a successful launch and getting the points for it is recovering the rocket in a flyable condition? Those teams did not get any points for the launch day. Okay. Um, so designing a structurally sound rocket is a, is a big issue. So, um, so we got away from that. I'm surprised none of those turbine rockets fell apart or toppled over. Good for them. Uh, there was one group that had to, that uh, basically just put a solar panel on the side of their racket. I believe that was successful as well. Okay, um, and so we've already started talking about what this year's challenge is going is going to be. And since we haven't had our first uh, space grant consortium meeting about it yet, it's a little unclear. It has something to do with taking a panoramic photo at some point at launch. Um, so we have to get some more details on that, but probably going to involve something like a GoPro camera attached to the parachute at some point. Okay, so I'll just show you a couple of the electronics on the inside. Um, so when you launch a rocket like this, you can maybe kind of tell from the way it's broken up already, it's basically built into stages. And so once it goes up and it launches, and it goes over Apogee, uh, there are a couple little gunpowder charges actually inside the rocket. And they go off and the pressure pushes these little segments apart. They're held together by little one-time use plastic screws that get torn apart by the gunpowder charge. And so that pops out your parachute. Um, and so generally, for a lot of these rockets, they have two stages. They have a smaller parachute that comes out first, and then the full one comes coming out later. The reason you do that is because you want a big one to make sure it lands softly. But if you put that off right at the very top of the trajectory, then it's going to take a very long time to come down, and the wind is going to carry this thing far away. All right, the actual competition launch is done in, done in uh, Bong Recreation Area in Kenosha. And so they have a little rocket pad, but all the area around it is basically sort of swampy, reedy stuff with some trees. And so you don't want it going super far where you have to wade through all this mud and grass and worry about ticks only to find out it got stuck in a tree where you can't reach it. Okay, so you put in this little one first because if you just wait for, for it to start coming down a while before the big one comes up, that can actually rip apart the rocket as well because of the extra tension in the cord trying to stop a rocket that's already falling quickly. So you just try to slow it with a little one called a drogue and then put up the main one later when it's lower. 
Okay? But to control all of this and to record your data for your, your altitude and to record your data for the challenge, the voltage measurements and all that, um, there's basically a little bit of electronics that goes inside of this thing. So I'll pass this guy around again. Okay, so this is something called a sled. This basically just slides into one of the middle sections of the rocket here. And what it's powered by is basically an Arduino Uno. So it's just a little microcontroller in here that you can program from your laptop. You sort of upload the programming here. And then it's able to perform some simple tasks. And, it, and this thing has what's called a shield. It's an extra board that plugs in on top of it where you can plug in an SD card so it records all of your data. Okay, so that's the crux of it. These three little things over here are the voltage sensors that they used for their competition. And down here is the altimeter. This actually measures the altitude. So you're recording the data for the altitude and the voltage over time. This is also what's controlling the charges and telling the gunpowder charges when they go off, basically by tracking the altitude and doing the timing. Okay, you can pass that around, take a look at that. And there's a little, underneath there's a little nine volt battery that is the power for this thing. Okay. So in doing this, right, there's a couple different pieces, right? You have to do your CAD style design of your rocket before you build it. There's simulation software, so you, where you basically put in your design and try to estimate how high it's going to go and how stable it is. So you wanna try and build a stable rocket that's gonna go your target altitude of 3,000 feet, right? If anything, you probably wanna design something that can go a little higher than that and know where your wiggle room is in terms of reducing uh, weight or adding weight or things like that as needed, right, after you actually do a test launch and see how far off the software was. Usually it's not bad, but it's not exact, okay? Uh, plus you have to do some ele um, electronics, right? You have to do the wiring up here and there's some uh, computer pr programming with regards to the Arduino. And of course, then there's the actual building of the rocket itself, right? Machining parts, painting it, and things like that, All right? So there's a lot of different jobs that go into this, uh, a lot of different uh, ways that students can get involved, okay? All right, so talking a little bit about launch day. So this thing over here on the left, this was the tiny little rocket that they launched off last October. It was about yay big. Um, they still have it, though one of the fins is kind of flown off. You know, those, those kit rockets are not very stable, not very good. Um, but this is what you actually have to do on launch day, is basically load up all the parts, fold in your parachute, right? Make, make sure you think it's actually gonna come out when it's supposed to. Um, when they actually are late, allowed to do as many launches as they want and can fit in during launch day, and the, the best one is used. Um, so our team actually did two launches, and the second one, the main parachute actually did not come out because it was not packed tight enough, and so it's kind of stuck in the tube. Luckily, the drogue slowed it down enough, and it landed on some soft grass, and there was no damage. Um, but if you, when I let you guys look at this later, you can kind of see there's still a bunch of like scuff marks and things from, from when it landed. Um, but it actually takes a while, like an, like an hour or more, to actually prep the rocket on Rocket Day, even though it's done right, and get ready to go. Um, but it's pretty fun because you have these 13 teams. Everybody launches at least once. Many will launch twice. And on the same day, there's also something called the First Nations launch. So Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium puts on this collegiate rocket launch for our members, but they also put on a national program, which is a very similar sort of launch, but it's a uh, separate competition just happening on the same day where their target audience is uh, Native, Native American groups, so like t tribal colleges and that. So. Um, so in Wisconsin, we actually have one College of Menominee Nation up in the northern part of the state as part of the Space Grant Consortium. So schools like that kind of around the country are invited to participate as well. So there are dozens and dozens of rocket launches on this day. So it's, it's pretty spectacular to go see. So if anybody doesn't want to go and be a part of our rocket team but would like to go see the launch, you can go see that. I can give you the date. It's sometime in, in April as well. Okay. And so with that, let me actually show you a video of their launch, at least up to the point where I stopped recording because I wasn't looking through my phone. So you see there's a bunch of little um, rails out there, so they actually do put them on railings. Oh, there it goes, and at some point you start to lose it because it goes high enough, okay? Um, so there's worked, it actually went up, right, both times, came down, was recoverable, all right? Uh, and all throughout the day they start marking off the different team results on this big chart. Did you have a successful flight? What was your altitude? Things like that. Um, we actually thought we were going to do really, really well, all right? Compared to the year before, where we had a team that was, it was nominally Sheboygan's team, but it was really all Marathon County students because Marathon County was not part of the consortium and sort of borrowed our name since we didn't have a team. Um, they actually got fifth place, even though both of their flights that they did a year ago were not high enough um, because you'd be surprised how many of these 
intrepid college students just don't do the outreach portion or do a terrible presentation and lose points on that. So when we had a pretty decent launch this year and we thought we did a good job in the presentation and the reports and all that, thought we were gonna do very well. Turns out uh, about half the teams had really good launches, all right? So of that target uh, altitude 3,000 feet, uh, we had, I think it was like 2,700, 2,800 something feet like that, and that's, that sounds pretty good. Uh, ultimately, the winner was Fox Valley, and they were less than 100 feet off from the target. Um, so our team ended up placing fifth, but it was pretty tight at the top, and ultimately it mostly came down to just feet difference in your actual altitude, um, which is kind of annoying when you think about what the uncertainty in the altimeter might actually be. Right, you might actually be within error of having one, but it is what it is, uh, we're gonna win this year. But uh, we're, we're glad though that all three of the, the UW colleges campuses that are in the consortium, so that's us, Fox Valley, and Washington County, uh, all three had teams last year and we placed one, three, and five. So that turned out pretty well for us. And the big one is always Platteville, right? The big engineering school, they've won most years in recent memory, and so they only came in second, and I know they were really upset about that. So we're glad that at least Fox Valley beat them which is good. Uh, but again, we'll be number one this year. So, um, so that's most of what I wanted to say about the collegiate rocket launch portion before I start getting into the really big rockets. Um, so I don't think I'll pass these pieces around because they're pretty big, but please feel free to come up and look at them and you know, pick them up afterwards as well. Anybody have any questions on the collegiate rocket launch stuff before I move on? Yeah, Mark. Um, what are the other schools that are in it? Are they all UW schools? Or? Uh, largely. So in the consortium, um, so it's just the three, two-year campuses, right? Um, all of the four-year UWs, except for, I think, Stout and Eau Claire are part of the consortium. And I think generally about half of them or so field teams for this. Um, Marquette is a member, and I think they had a team. MSOE is a member, they always have a team for this. A um, Couple other private schools, Alverno, and I think, I wanna say St. Norbert, I think just left the consortium. Uh, a couple other smaller ones. Um, Western Technical College, I think, is the only technical school in, in our consortium. So what do we yeah. have to do to belong to it? Uh, basically, you need somebody like me who is willing to be the institutional rep and go to the meetings twice a year. We pay, of order, $100 um, membership fee every year. Okay. And basically what that does is it goes towards nas the National Space Grant Consortium um, hires a lobbyist to go to Congress to ask for funds, but we're not allowed to use the federal funds to do that directly. So basically, any school that's a member anywhere in the country paying membership fees, we all aggregate it and hire one lobbyist for the year. Uh, I'll say it's not as much just arguing for the funds as it is arguing that the funds should stay part of Space Grant Consortium Program and not go to other NASA outreach offices, which is kind of weird. But that's, I mean, it is what it is. It seems like a waste of money, but it's something that if we didn't do, we wouldn't have the consortium really well funded. Um, but basically that, and then we also have to do what's called a match. So when all of these programs, you have to um, provide a match so that you're, it's not just NASA doling out money, but we're also seeming invested. So as far as Sheboygan is concerned, our match is largely um, the amount of time I put in using my average hourly, hourly salary and then if we actually get a little bit that we actually put in for club funds for the rockets and things like that, or you know, what's the average printing cost of what I spend on, on flyers and stuff like that. So it's actually not terribly onerous to be a member other than you need to have at least one person who cares to do this stuff. So, yeah, sure. Any other questions? Okay, so let's talk about the really big rockets then. So this is the other one and a half or so project that we have, all right? So collegiate rocket launch is pretty neat, and that's something that we can pretty easily do every year as long as we have students who are interested, okay? And it's not terribly onerous in, in terms of time. You know, it's some hours per week, but not awful, and you get a few students together and you can do it. Space Grant actually does provide uh, something like $750 worth of you know, parts and building, plus provides for the travel for the students to the actual launch day. So usually that's not enough to build a rocket unless you're very lean and you only do one test launch and stuff like that. But it's not too hard to get enough um, club funds from our, our SGA to help supplement that a little bit to be able to do an extra launch and try some things out. This other program is a little bit bigger, a little bit more uh, time investment and a lot more money investment, but is also, I think, way cooler. Sorry for collegiate rocket launch, but this is the way cooler project. Um, so uh, these other 
projects. It's one and a half. It's called Rock On and Rock Sat. Rock Sat C specifically is what we did. And so this one is an, an honest to God uh, rocket into space project. So Collegiate Rocket Launch, they design and build their own rocket, have a simple payload that goes up. Rock, rock On and Rock Sat C, it's all about designing and building the payload. We leave the actual rocket construction and launch to the contractors that work with NASA, right, the real rocket scientists, but we do get to put something into space as part of the program. Uh, so we, we launched these rockets from Wallops Island or Wallops Flight Facility, it's in Virginia. So NASA has a whole bunch of bases all over the country, right? Kennedy Space Center is sort of the big launch facility that people know, right, down in Florida, Cape Canaveral. That's where all the really big rockets, rockets launch, okay? Uh, Wallops Island is a smaller facility, and it's a little bit more sort of, I don't want to say risky, but uh, sort of research, trial and error sort of launches, a little bit smaller scale, sort of trying out technologies and doing things that have a little bit more of a scientific research focus than maybe a put things in orbit or put humans in orbit type of focus, okay? Um, so there's, it was originally sort of a, na a Navy base, and there is still a Navy presence there. Um, when we went last June, they, it was actually the same time as a uh, air show that was in Ocean City, Maryland, kind of up somewhere about here, okay? Um, so we got to see the, I think it's called the Thundercat, not the Thundercats, what was it? The Thunderbirds, right? And then this year, the same air show was when we were up there and we got to see the Blue Angels. They were basically staying at the base and took off from there. So it's pretty neat. Um, and so there's also some other na Navy research things that go on there. They actually have some like radar ship mock-ups and things that they do for research there and some other projects as well. Um, but really the, the crux of what they do at Wallops is what's called sounding rockets. And sounding in this case basically just means taking a measurement. So for example, thinking about astronomy, I said I do a lot of radio and infrared astronomy. Infrared waves don't go through the atmosphere all that well. All right, so in general, to do infrared astronomy, you need to get above at least part of the atmosphere, if not all of it, to actually take an infrared picture of a nebula in a lot of the wavelengths we might care to, to study it, okay? So ultimately, what do we want? We want a space probe. We want a satellite, an orbiting telescope, all right? Um, and so we've had those now in more modern times, so things like the Spitzer Space Telescope or the Herschel Space Telescope. These are fairly modern instruments, and those are things that I've actually used for data for my own work. But thinking back historically, before we had those, space probes are, and satellites are really expensive, okay? So that's not the first thing you do. The first thing you do is put your infrared camera on something like a weather balloon that goes up into the stratosphere for hours, maybe days at a time, and try and take pictures from there, right? You're not above the whole atmosphere, but you're above a lot of it. And for infrared astronomy specifically, you're above a lot of the water vapor, okay? So it lets you do science that you can't do from the ground because you're above a lot of the atmosphere. And it's a relatively cheaper and easier way to test out technologies and sort of see what do I actually need to put in my infrared detector or my camera. So you sort of start with that process and then maybe you build up to doing sounding rockets. Okay, so now I wanna go higher than the balloons, but I'm not ready to invest in putting something in orbit yet, so I'll do a sounding rocket, something that will go up uh, in our case, the sounding rockets go up 70-something miles, all right? Um, there are some bigger ones that go over 100 miles up. Suborbital, you launch nearly straight up, just a little bit to the east, so when they come down, they go in the ocean and not on top of people, and then you just send out a recovery team to get the rocket payload, okay? So historically, that's what sounding rockets were used for, is sort of building up to putting things on space probes. And even now, even though we have things that we've, we put up in satellites that orbit the Earth, we still wanna try and test new technologies, and so they're still often used for that. Uh, not only do people use these kinds of devices for looking out to space, but looking back down. So if you think about like weather satellites, or satellites that track vegetation, or um, animal movement, and things like that, um, those are also things where you'd probably want a satellite, but sometimes a balloon or a rocket might do, or that might be a good way to sort of test and work towards something you would put on a satellite, okay? So at Wallops Life Facility, they actually still have a really active balloon program. And when I say balloon, I mean when it's fully inflated, it's the size of a football field. This is not a tiny balloon. This is a big balloon carrying like a semi-truck worth of payload equipment on it, right? These are big things, okay? And in fact, uh, I don't have a picture of a launch here, but when they launch them, it looks like it's underinflated. That's because it goes so high up that it goes to the lower uh, pressure point of the atmosphere. 
So you only have to put in a little bit of helium relatively down here, and then by the time it's at the top of where it's gonna go, it's expanded out to the size of a football field. Um, so I haven't been to a balloon launch, but I've seen the pictures and they look pretty stunning. I kind of want to go to one. I have been to the rocket launches, though. That's probably cooler anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that they have at Wallops is they also have some things that go on airplanes. So sometimes just going up on an airplane is high enough as well. In fact, uh, it's not run out of Wallops, but there is an infrared observatory called SOFIA, which is basically an infrared telescope inside a large plane that just flies across the Pacific. And they basically rigged up a way to make sure the telescope was always pointing at the same part in the sky, even as it jostles around. Um, so there's a lot of science that you can do if you can get above at least part of the atmosphere. And so Wallops does a lot of these pieces. Um, so Wallops is located here on this peninsula of Virginia that hangs off of uh, Maryland. Uh, it's basically a pretty rural area despite being on the East Coast. There's not a whole lot going on in that peninsula outside of this base. And then there's this Chincoteague Island over here, which is kind of a resort town. Um, and so that's sort of what's in, on the area. Um, so the main base is actually up here, all right, and so it is uh, controlled under security. So when we go with our team, we stay at the dorms on the base. And when I say dorms, I mean uh, single occupancy hotel rooms. And because we are staying on the base, we get security badges. So we get to go past security like the general public cannot do. And so we are actually staying, you know, like 100 feet away from the airfield. And there's no actual other wall between us and the airfield. So it's a pretty neat experience to be able to go to this, uh, to this base. So that's the main base where they do a lot of the, the actual work and planning for things, and that's where uh, Mission Control is. And then down here is the Wallops Island area. That's where they actually have the, the Navy radar mock-ups mock mock -ups, uh, and the launch pads for their sounding rockets. Okay. All right. I will also mention that the biggest rockets that they launch out of Wallops are, are called the Antares rockets. And these are the unmanned resupply missions to the International Space Station. So that's sort of the big thing that they do at Wallops. But mostly it's, it's sort of smaller to medium scale rocket launches. Um, so here's a couple pictures from around the area. Uh, oh, I should mention up here. See the basketball court has the nice NASA logo on it. They have NASA logos on everything, which is really neat. I don't think you can kind of tell, but there's that water tower up there near the top that also has NASA logos on it. Um, so you walk around the base. And generally, if you don't step on the airfield, security doesn't you know, tackle you or anything. You can kind of peek around, see what's going on. Um, so they do have a range control center building. And this, they did not let us go into the room, but they let us go into the room above the room and look down into it. This is basically mission control. So for an Antares rocket, every single one of these stations would be full up. It's kind of like Apollo 13, you know, something like that. Um, not quite a full staff for our sounding rockets, I don't think, but still quite a few people watching, you know, making sure that the um, they're tracking where the rocket is, so when the fisherman goes out to get it, they have some idea, and they're not just zooming around the ocean all day. Um, they also have to track the trajectory, because if it goes too far off of the trajectory and might come back on the land, they have to blow it up before it goes any further. All right? So speaking of sounding rockets with infrared telescopes on it, uh, my thesis advisor at Virginia started doing infrared instrumentation before he focused on just the astronomy part. Um, he was at uh, University of Colorado, I think, for his grad school work. And he, was, he designed and built uh, an instrument for a rocket that was launched at White Sands in New Mexico. So they're not launching over the ocean, they're launching over a very large desert of a lot of white sand that is generally uninhabited, okay? Um, and his first launch, they had to blow it up because it was going too far off that trajectory and they were afraid it was gonna go to like Albuquerque or something like that. So that's when he decided to get out of instrumentation and get to something that was less likely to blow up. All right, so this is the kind of thing that, you know, they have to check, you know, the safety for that. Um, luckily, our, you know, our rocket launches went on without a hitch, which is good. Um, this is a picture of one of their planes that they have that they can uh, upload a lot of scientific equipment on and just kind of fly over areas and track the vegetation or animal life, things like that. Uh, they also have some other planes and helicopters that they use, um, not only for their scientific missions, but when they're doing a launch, they have to clear the area. So both the water has to be cleared of boats and the land around there has to be cleared of people. There are a lot of people with duck blinds and otherwise out hunting that they want to get out of the area. And uh, a lot of the economy in the town is based on fishermen. So there are a lot of fishermen that want to get out for the day and go fish. And they, there is the Coast Guard that sort of tracks the area. They actually don't have as much authority as you would think to totally stop a boat and say, hey, we're going to launch you, wait here. Basically, they say it's not a good idea if you go, but if somebody goes, you have to wait for them to get out of the area. And so uh, I, I don't think we've ever had an issue with this, but I know for some of their launches, they spend a while convincing a person to get out of their duck blind for at least an hour or two and then come back so they can launch a rocket. 
Over here on, on the right-hand side, uh, so this is a picture of uh, Rock On, the workshop last year in June. Um, so this is me on the right-hand side. In the middle is Ryan Kosolik, who is a student here. He's uh, just started at UW-Milwaukee this fall, a biology student, but he's been here for a while at Sheboygan. He was SGA president last year. Um, and then this on the left-hand side, that's uh, Christine Thompson. She is the uh, assistant director of uh, Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium. Um, so basically the way that this Rock On thing came about and the way we got involved in these larger rocket projects is that when I started three years ago, Christine was also starting her job. And so she was going around to the different affiliate members and sort of talking about them, uh, talking to them about what they do and sort of what their needs are. Um, and so I was pretty new here, and so I didn't know a whole lot about what kinds of projects we had in the past or what things were going to turn out to be like. Um, but I, I knew a little bit already from talking to people um, sort of what our demographics and our student population was like. So when she asked me what uh, I needed and what I thought we would be able to do as a consortium member, I told her, you know, look, I have a lot of students who are freshmen, sophomore status, and a lot of them have jobs and other things outside of class, right? I want to look for ways to try and engage people in doing some kind of research in astronomy or physics or something related to that. But I need things that are accessible at the freshman, sophomore level, and things that students can do even if they can't put in tons of time, or at least maybe things where we can give them some good monetary incentive so that it's worth them taking out time to be able to do these things. Um, so she listened to me, and so she's actually made a couple really good uh, changes in the Space Grant Consortium that are friendly to all the two-year campuses. Um, so example, uh, the undergraduate scholarship, generally you can apply for that in spring to have money for next year. A lot of students that are interested in STEM, I find out about them when they take my physics class, and that's usually the last year that they're here, so they're going somewhere else. So uh, she was able to put aside one of the scholarships for someone in a two-year school to apply for in fall to have the scholarship in spring. So this is my first little bit of advertising for the year. Uh, somewhere around, it's the end of September or beginning of October is the deadline for that. So any of you who are going to be here or even at one of the other Space Grant Consortium institutions in spring, you can apply for that one, that one position, all right, which usually doesn't get a ton of applicants and maybe get a scholarship for spring. And even if you don't get that one, you go back in the general pool with everybody else for the scholarships for the next year, okay? So the way this came about is that she said, she called me up, um, I think it was last year in like February or so, and said, hey, there's this really cool program called Rock On, Col uh, Colorado Space Grant Consortium puts it on, it's in Virginia, all right? So this is kind of like another one of these national programs that a state consortium puts on, kind of like the First Nations launch that we do. Um, and she said, um, you know, so some of our schools from Wisconsin have done this in the past. It's really great. Basically, you build a rocket payload. You can take some students. You get experience actually putting something in space. Um, and, you know, we also have this generic program in Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium called a NASA Competitions Fund. And, you know, you can apply for up to 3000 bucks per school for any other NASA program that's not covered under our other programs. And hint, hint, if you apply for it, you're going to get it and you're going to get all the money. <laughs> right. And so the whole thing for Ryan and I to go was like 4,000 bucks. So we were like, yeah, we'll do that. And we cobbled together a little from the department and from the campus to pay for this. And then uh, Space Grant paid for Christine to go because she, as a staff member of theirs, all right? And so we went and we were a team of three and we did this Rock On program. And what Rock On is, is that you build a payload like this, all right, from a kit. So you walk in there. If you don't already have a team of three, they put you in a team of three. There are about 20 or so teams and they give you a box full of parts and then over the next several days you put together all the parts right solder them in make the electrical connections do a bunch of tests uh, put in the programming test the programming and all this sort of stuff and then eventually you end up with this payload that goes on the rocket that goes into space so rock on is just about a week don't have to design anything but you get to actually build and test your own payload, and you get to bring it back and say, this went into space, all right? So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this, and I'll start passing it around. Uh, but this, again, is something controlled by an Arduino. So it's an Arduino Mega instead of an Arduino Uno, so it's a little bit bigger, but still generally just a microcontroller. And so just for reference, these microcontrollers, these Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, have roughly the kind of computing power that like a home PC would have in the early to mid-90s. All right, compressed down into this little guy, okay? I think they're a little bit easier to use in program though, okay? Um, but basically what they have here is 
that Arduino Mega is sort of powering the whole thing and controlling all of it. Um, but then there's this, uh, this board up here that we solder together all these different resistors and capacitors and different components and some relays. Solder on some sensors so we have accelerometers in three dimensions. We have gyroscopes in three dimensions. Humidity, temperature, and pressure sensor inside the rocket. Little SD card here to record data. And then over on here, this other board is what's called a Geiger counter. It basically detects radiation. So you have this little tube full of uh, fairly inert gas. And you apply a high voltage across it, like a couple hundred volts. And it's really not electrically uh, conductive, except that when a radiation particle, we use that sort of general term, comes in, it can ionize the gas. And so you get like a little jump, a little drop in the voltage, a little spike in current that registers as a count. And so you're basically counting how many radioactive particles come into the tube by looking for those little drops. Um, and this really sophisticated piece of equipment that actually went into space is powered by two 9-volt batteries from Energizer. All right. So you, know, you think things that go into space have to be really complicated and really expensive. They don't necessarily. All right. If you're not putting something on the space station, certainly. Oh, the other little thing that I'll mention, uh, two of them there real quick. So there's this little plastic box. So everybody got a memento box. So I got to send up a little keychain from the bookstore here and said that was in space. Uh, the other thing that goes along with this is that you want to be able to turn this thing on when the launch starts so that you don't drain your 9 volt battery from the time you load it into the rocket until it goes off. So part of that is that there's this violet cable that runs in that they sort of turn, turn on right before the launch that says, OK, get ready to go. But the actual way that it turns on your payload, there's this little thing called a G-switch here that you can play with. It's basically just a little bit of hardware on sort of a spring so that when the launch goes up, that depresses and that turns your thing on. So once you've gotten the violet signal and that goes, you're on. And then it runs until we take it apart when we get it back. So I'll let you pass that around. All right. So this is what we did last year in June, so June 2016. Uh, the three of us did one. Uh, each of the 20 or so teams built uh, basically an identical version of that. And what went up in the rocket was roughly half rock on payloads and then about half of what we call the Rocksat C payloads. Okay. Um, so let me just show you, these are a couple of the components, right? the major components. So the Geiger board, there's also a, a Z accelerometer, sort of accelerometer in the launch direction, and the shield board with the Arduino there. Okay. All right. Um, and so this is sort of what, what it looks like when you put it all together. Okay. Um, so that plastic uh, piece that it's all mounted on, that part was actually uh, not flown in space. For most of the teams, they assembled one that looked like that, and so they actually had their plate go into space. Uh, what they actually do is stack a bunch of them into one of these canisters. And so that canister holds, I think, something like eight or nine of these. And then the canisters go in the rocket. Okay? Uh, to save space, some teams, and we were one of the few, actually put our payload directly on the lid of the canister. They did not let us take the lid home. So when we got it back, we had to transfer everything back over to that plastic piece. Okay? But otherwise, everything else went up into space. So this is what it looks like when you start assembling it and our general workstation over here. Um, it's actually pretty nice. They give every team a, a big table. You get an electrostatic discharge mat where you get to plug in so you don't shock and sort out, short out anything. You get your soldering iron. You get your different pliers and different tools, your magnifying glass and stuff like that. So it's a pretty big operation, especially since considering they're based out of Colorado. So the guy that runs this thing, Chris Kohler from Colorado, he organizes this, he organizes this with his students in Colorado, packs up everything, and ships it out to Virginia. And then they unpack it every year and ship all their stuff back. Um, so he's been doing it for about a decade. So they, they've really practiced this and gotten it to work pretty smoothly now. OK. All right, so that's the Rock On project. And so it's sort of a baby step into these other projects that they have called RockSat. Um, so there's RockSat C and then RockSat X. And basically, both of those are spending the school year with the team actually designing your own payload instead of just building one from a kit um, and, and doing whatever experiment you want to do and putting that up on the rocket. Okay? So these are a couple examples of some different Rocksat payloads. Um, on the left here is one from Rocksat C, so that's what we did this past year. Um, so this is roughly the other half of the same sounding rocket that Rock On goes up on. Okay? Um, but you're not necessarily bound to putting it on that tiny, thin little thing. Uh, you can basically either buy a canister or half a canister. We did half a canister. Okay? Um, and then on the right-hand side here is an example of Rocksat X. So Rocksat X is another step up in complexity and cost. And that's on a bigger rocket. 
Um, and that one actually goes up higher, I want to say 80 or 90 something miles, okay? Um, and that one, they also have the skin come off. So you can do things where you actually have to expose to space. Rockset, you do have some options to have little, you know, little ports if you want to expose a little sensor or do some you know, atmosphere samples, things like that. Rockset X, they just have the whole panels of the rocket come off. So you can do whatever exposure to space in the high altitude you want to do. It also means that the payload you build has to be able to withstand reentry. Now, it's not like an Apollo reentry, so it's not awful, but if you see the videos that they've taken of it, it does kind of fire up a little bit. It does get warm. And of course, it also splashes back down into the ocean, so it has to be waterproof. So I don't know if we're ever going to get up to the stage of doing Rockset X. We've talked about it. Um, if we as a school continue doing Rockset C or ever move up to Rockset X, it would probably be something where we would do as a collaboration with one of the four-year schools that has a little bit more students and resources and the expertise for doing something like that. Um, so it's possible we move up there. Okay. Um, but what our team wanted to do was primarily something where we put DNA into space and just saw what the damage was. So I mentioned that Ryan was a biology student. He was really super excited after Rock On, wanted to do a Rockset project right away. Um, and he was really inspired by this team from University of Puerto Rico that has a Rockset X project. They've basically been doing the program since the beginning and just refining their experiment every year. And they do a really complicated experiment where they use compressed oxygen to sterilize a chamber and then they have um, like a, a, an arm that kind of goes out and collects micrometeorites when it's up in space and then they put it in the sterile chamber and they're looking when they get it back for evidence of like amino acids or things like that that are on the micrometeorites. So it's basically a search for extraterrestrial life or building blocks of life in our own solar system outside of Earth. So that's, that's really amazing. And so we got, him to, got Ryan to scale back the idea a little bit, all right? So at first we were thinking we're gonna put E. coli up into space and they didn't say no directly, but of course there's a little bit of worry. Well, you know, what if the rocket crashes and you spill your E. coli in the ocean? You know, maybe that's not a great thing. Um, so we scaled down to DNA plasmids. All right, basically we, we got these uh, plasmids that you can order pretty easily from um, suppliers, from lab suppliers, um, that has, contains a gene isolated from jellyfish where it glows under black light. It's a, the bioluminescence gene. And so we flew a bunch of that and then when you bring it back, if it's not damaged, you can introduce it to E. coli, they'll take it up, and so when you grow them on a petri dish, you put a black light over and they glow if the DNA was not damaged. All right. So that was sort of the crux of the experiment that we wanted to do um, from Roxat then, is look at that. Okay. Um, so this is the payload that they designed. Right? So it's roughly half a canister, so altogether bigger than the Rock-On payload. This is the electronics half. Okay. Um, so what I don't have with me is the other half, which is this containment unit. Um, so it's basically a 3D printed plastic unit just for holding the different vials for the DNA that we put up. Okay? Um, so everything that's liquid has to be double contained. So basically we had tiny vials inside bigger vials. And to make sure it didn't leak, one student just threw a bunch of those in the dryer, ran it for a while, and then measured how much liquid was still in the little vials and made sure it was the amount they put in. Like, okay, good, that worked, all right? Like, <laughs> and I think, I can't remember if we actually do this or if we did this or if we were just planning on doing it, but for, for spin tests, you know, somebody was saying, well, we can just go to like where they, uh, they balance tires and just put it on one of those things and spin it. Like, you can, really, <laughs> you can really get by with very little in terms of testing for these things. Um, we do have a 3D printer now down in the mechanical engineering lab that I believe Platteville actually owns. It's part of the collaborative program. Guy Campbell got it moved over from Washington County for us. For a while, we were trying to print that big unit, um, but 3D printers can be kind of finicky, and it's not exactly a new one. So ultimately, we realized one of our team members had a neighbor that works at a company that could print this thing for 260 bucks. So we just said, okay, go print that. All right, and so we dealt with that instead. Um, so we'll hopefully, we'll get the 3D printer actually working to do something useful some point soon. But 3D printing is actually getting to be pretty cheap nowadays. Um, so basically, we just had a bunch of those vials. Um, and so mostly they were hydrated, so they were a solution. We did also fly some dry DNA. Um, the students did some research and they sort of, uh, they found some, uh, some papers that said that um, putting the DNA in, in liquid, actually hydrating it, actually made it more susceptible to damage for various reasons, okay? And we're looking at both you know, radiation damage, but also just the vibration and the actual, the G-forces of the launch itself, right? It's hard to actually separate what's actually doing the damage to the DNA. So we did fly some dry samples, 
and about half of them were also wrapped in some shielding. All right, so this is where we were trying to, to tease out a little bit the difference between radiation damage and other damage. And so one of the students found a company that sells this, what's called Silflex tape. So it's not actually an adhesive tape, it's basically uh, silicone sort of rubbery tape that's impregnated with, uh, I think it's tin and tungsten, so no lead in this, non-toxic. Uh, they actually market to places like nuclear power plants. So if you have like a little crease in something that you want to cover up, put a bunch of this tape on. Um, so we, we ordered one roll of it, which is about 600 bucks, but that was the least that they would sell to us because they don't sell in tiny samples. The good news is we have most of the roll left over, so we'll never have to buy any more of this tape again. <laughs> but I'll pass this around. It's a little heavier than you might think, okay? But it's definitely nicer to work with than lead, which is what we were previously considering using for our shielding. So about half of our vials get wrapped in that, that, uh, that tape there, okay? And then for the actual electronics package, um, we did actually borrow some things from the Rock-On design, right? No use in completely just starting over. Um, but basically, instead of one Geiger counter, we had three, okay? And so, and so instead of building from scratch, they just ordered pre-made Geiger counter boards. And we have three different tubes on here. So there's actually two different kinds of tubes. Uh, one is sensitive to alpha and beta radiation. Or sorry, yeah, alpha and beta radiation. The other one is sensitive to alpha, beta, and gamma. So these are different kinds of radiation. And then uh, one of the tubes, the one that we had uh, two of, also wrapped one of them in some Silflex tape as well to try and understand how that shielding works, okay? And so then again, there's an Arduino Omega under, Arduino Omega under here. Uh, they designed their own circuit board with some software and had a company in Germany print it up and send it out, and a couple other basic center, sensors like your accelerometer and gyroscope stuff again. And it looks a little fancier, but this is again, basically just a nine volt battery that powers the whole thing. And somewhere on here, that's our G-switch as well. So we use the same sort of G-switch technology to turn this thing on. So still ultimately not super complicated, right? You wanna make things as simple as possible, and if you know that something works, adapt it rather than design from beginning. So I'll pass that around for you, okay. All right, so that was, that was the whole package, right? So about half of it was DNA containment, the other half was this electronics package, okay? Um, so this is sort of what it starts to look like when you put things together. Um, so there were about half a dozen or so Rockset C teams this year. Um, most of them got a whole canister. Um, so we got a half, so we were actually, that's uh, us in the back there, and then this up front was Temple University's. Um, that's the one, that's the team that we paired with. They also got half a canister. Um, which basically meant all the weight constraints and center of mass constraints and things like that, you have to communicate with your team that's on the other half of the canister to make sure you meet that. Um, and this is actually first day check-in where they're doing some tests like your weight and rough center of mass. Um, they're checking the outside of your canister to make sure you don't have any loose wires that are putting voltage on the outside of your canister that are gonna start a fire on the rocket, you know, things like that. Uh, and this is a picture of all the teams doing Rocksat C this year with the the payload part of the rocket. So this thing's kind of tall. Um, you know, the payload part of the rocket would probably fit roughly across this row of tables, okay? Once you actually put the rocket boosters, the thing that launches on there, it roughly doubles in size. So the whole rocket would probably not fit in, fit in this room, all right? So it's a pretty big guy. Um, they do try to do everything really on the cheap here at Wallops, not like risky, but as in being economical. Uh, and really trying to keep the cost down so that students can actually do things like this. So I mentioned we got half a canister. Um, that cost us $7,000 to buy onto the rocket. To put something in space for only $7,000, as tiny as it is, that is amazingly cheap. So how do they do it? The main part of the rocket, that skin, they reuse every year. The boosters that they use are actually surplus military rockets that they adapt into launch rockets. They have two different kinds and they put them together. All right, and so they really try to reuse and keep things cheap and use surplus parts wherever, wherever possible. Um, and they're really not making any money on this. There's a lot of people at NASA and the contractors that are sort of donating their time for this program. Okay, oops, that's long. So the other objective that kind of went along with this once we realized what was possible with it um, is that aside from just looking at the damage to the DNA, you know, we decided we wanted to look at a little bit of the radiation that was coming in, trying to track how that might be doing the damage. And so one of my other students who is looking to go into astrophysics, who's also at uh, UW-Milwaukee this year, was reading up a little bit on radiation exposure in the high, high atmosphere and getting into space. 
Um, and so he learned about this thing called the Fotzer Maximum. So you might think that the higher you get in the atmosphere, the more exposed to space you are, so the radiation counts will go up and up and up and up. Well, what's actually happening, though, is that if you look at your Geiger counter where it's just detecting counts, so it doesn't distinguish between one high-energy particle and one lower-energy particle. It's just numbers of particles. That actually hits a maximum somewhere closer to like the 16 to 24 kilometer up mark. Part of the reason for this is something called a particle shower. If one really high energy uh, particle, say a cosmic ray comes in from space and hits something in the atmosphere, that can split it off into a bunch of smaller particles, which hit other things that split it off into a bunch of smaller particles that split it off into a bunch of other smaller particles. So that's a particle shower. And so you're splitting up that energy more and more among the particles, so you're not really having more radiation in terms of more energy, but in terms of counts that your Geiger counter would pick up, that actually can increase. And then eventually the atmosphere starts screening those out, so it's sort of a nice calculus problem, right? You have a growth and a decay part, and so you reach a maximum somewhere around that altitude. So this was our secondary objective for the mission, was to try and look, uh, look for this Fotzer maximum and get some better characteristics on it. Okay. Um, so this is what assembly looks like as you're actually putting the rocket together. So this is Ryan and uh, it's Chris Kohler from Colorado Space Grant Consortium. They're plugged in in their electrostatic discharge jackets to make sure they don't short anything out. Uh, putting a canister in this rack and then the couple of those racks go into the rocket skin. Um, and so this is what it looks like when they're putting it on the truck to go out to the launch base. And they actually put the rocket boosters out on the launch base. Oh, and that's our, our Rock-On uh, teams from last year. Everybody proudly holding their canisters as they're about to be integrated. Okay. And so as part of the preparation, one of the things they do before they send the rocket away is they do something called a spin test. So they just put that part of the rocket in something that spins around and look for where it's unbalanced. And I don't know if you can kind of see there are some things on the side of the rocket. They have a really ingenious way of balancing this thing, which is by putting weights on the outside. <laughs> To get it in balance. All right. They also do something called a vibe test, um, which I'm not going to show because you can't see anything and just sounds annoying, but basically they just shake it at different frequencies really hard. All right. So when we take our payloads out there, the first thing they do after the initial check is they do an integration, spin test, vibe test, give it back to everybody, see what broke, and see what you have to fix and make stronger, and then reintegrate with the rock end ones a couple days later. Uh, our team, because they were really conscientious about this and planned ahead, and design things really simply, didn't really have to fix anything. There were a lot of other teams that very scarily were in the hotel room, like finishing their designs before the initial test, and then had a whole bunch of, thing, bunch of things break and have to go back. And somehow their, their experiments worked, as far as I know. Um, but I was, I was kind of surprised that more of them weren't like super ready to go. Like Our team was like so worried that we were going to be behind, like we were way ahead. So we were good. Um, this is actually a picture of me with the students who went along. Okay. Um, so there's me, that's Ryan, this is uh, Bob Aloisi, he's the one who's at Milwaukee, wants to be an astrophysicist. Uh, he actually works in, uh, I think he had a master's degree in like paper science or something. He was getting close to retirement and said, hey, I want to go be an astronomer, how do I get to astronomy grad school? So that's what I've been helping him work on. This is his son who just started at La Crosse last year that he got involved with the programming, so we took him along with the trip for us. And then this is Josh Janzik, who is an uh, engineering student here in the co collaborative. Uh, who's still around. So this is um, them letting us sit underneath the rocket the day before it launches. So that's what it looks like on the rail. Okay. And you can kind of tell here, there's the, the top section and then the two different boosters that they kind of MacGyver into there. Um, and I think I'm remembering this correctly. Um, the top, or sorry, the first uh, booster here, the first stage, is not actually screwed into the second one. Just sitting on the rail, the, the weight of the rocket keeps it on. And when then it goes up, the thrust of the rocket keeps it in, so when the first stage runs out, it just falls out. The second one actually has some explosive bolts or something. So, um, But when uh, you're not going to be able to see it in the video because, again, I was just holding up my phone and looking off here and didn't really track it up. Um, but when you're there and actually watching the launch, you can actually see the first, one, first uh, stage and the thing fall out. You can watch it fall away to the ocean and even hear a splash, and then you can see the second one uh, take it up the rest of the way, which is pretty neat. All right, so on the right-hand side there is one of their remote cameras from one of the launches, right? way closer than we're allowed to be. Um, the closest we were able to be was this past year. I think it was something like 1,500 feet away from the launch pad, so still ridiculously close. Like It feels we should not be that close. Um, 
But I'm going to actually show you the launch from last year's Rock On because I like the video more because on the upper left there you can actually see the moon. Um, but very similar launch to this year. And I'm going to see if I can actually get the volume to work since it was working earlier but seemed to have turned off at some point. So let me just try and turn that on. We'll see if the volume works or not. It's okay if it doesn't. Basically, all you can hear is people counting down, and it goes, <laughs> but it goes <laughs> like roughly a second after you see the thing go off. There's your rocket. Up it goes. Oh, you can hear it a little bit. OK, there you go. There you go. So there's your rocket, and that's where I stop paying attention. All right, so that thing goes up 70 miles, falls back down, lands in the ocean. All right, this is what recovery looks like. They hire a local fisherman to go fish for rockets that day. All right, they just, they, the thing is pressurized, so it floats. Um, they try and track it by radar as far as they can. They usually get a pretty good read on where it splashes down. And of course, there's a big parachute that comes out. I think it also emits some dye. So usually the, the boat has a pretty good idea of where to go, and then they can see it from far off. And so they just go haul it onto this boat, which comes back into the harbor. Um, this is the picture of all the rock on and rocks at sea people um, from, that, from last year. Okay. And this is the kind of data you get back. So this is just sort of a rough plot of it. Um, but for example, our accelerometers are all up here. So in the Z direction, this is in the direction that you actually launch the rocket, you see a big spike for the first stage, another spike for the second stage. Um, or let's see, do I have my gyros over here? My gyroscopes over here, Z, X, and Y. This thing is intentionally spun up a little bit as it's going to help keep it stable. So you can see. Large numbers, these are uncalibrated this, out of the sensor, but basically lots of spinning around the central axis. Um, and so this is taken for the first roughly minute of the launch. And then if you look at it a little further, some of the other things you can look at. Uh, what I plotted up there on top left was the Geiger counter integrated counts. So basically a very sharp uh, bit of data where it's kind of exposed, mostly in space, collecting a lot of radiation counts. Or like here, the pressure inside the rocket kind of jostles a little bit during the launch, stays pretty stable. This is the point where it got back to the launch facility and then they opened it back up and depressurized the rocket. So here I'm actually plotting out for hundreds of minutes afterwards. This thing launches at 6 a.m. It's back on land by like 1 or 2 p.m. And then they take it apart and you get your data off of your ST card. All right. So it's so all pretty neat. So that was our rock on data from last year. Okay. And so then this is what Bob put together for our Fitzer Math Maximum um, study this year. Um, for this, since we're, there were a bunch of Rock On teams that all had Geiger counters, and all that data gets put up on the Rock On website, he just downloaded all of that and integrated it together and made a plot of radiation counts versus altitude. And that's a very nice picture of what the Fitzer Maximum looks like right there. So somewhere right around the 20 kilometer mark, just like what he was looking for, he got that. Okay. Um, and in terms of our DNA, it glowed, okay. So not all of the DNA was damaged. Um, uh, we did try to do get some good some statistics on dry versus wet, shielded versus unshielded. Also, we had some control that didn't go up in the rocket. Um, basically, and we kind of knew this going in that with the size and weight constraints we had in the rocket, we weren't going to be able to get really good statistics on this. Plus, you're, you're exposed to space for something like 10, 15 minutes during the rocket launch. Um, so we were able to see some variations in terms of how much damage, but it's hard to really interpret with the statistics we have. So really what the students are, are thinking about doing this year or maybe next year is potentially adapting this to a weather balloon type project. So something that doesn't go up as high but stays up for hours or days, and you can put more DNA up there so you can get much better statistics, a lot more exposure to radiation. And that's something that's also a lot cheaper uh, and a lot more attractable for students to do. Okay, so. Uh, I don't know if we'll get that off the ground for this year, but if not this year, they're really excited about uh, next year potentially. Now, in terms of all the other radiation data that we should have had from our three different Geiger boards, the micro SD card kind of cracked when they were taking it out of the payload, and at least two companies said that they could not fix it, so we don't have any of that data. So this is another reason why they want to rerun the experiment in some form, to actually look at some of these effects of the different kinds of radiation and the shielding. Um, but it wasn't a total loss. I mean, it was a really great experience for the students. They certainly learned a lot. I mean, this was really, really fun for me, too. Um, I mean, if, if nothing else, this is they designed and ran an experiment and learned how to improve it next time, which is sort of what science does. And they're actually looking to be around to run it again, which is great. 
Like it seems like uh, um, when I was an undergrad, I sort of got to that phase when it was time for me to go to grad school. I never actually returned to doing my initial project any better. Um, so I'm glad that they're really excited about this. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to put something together in this vein pretty soon. Um, but that's, uh, that's pretty much the story of, uh, of our rocketry programs here. So I just want to do a quick thank you, um, of course, to Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium, right, funding us through NASA. The collaboration with Platteville really made it nice for us to use their, their lab spaces down in the new engineering building and the 3D printer as much as we got out of it. Um, Wallops Flight Facility, of course. Virginia Space Grant Consortium helps out a little bit. Um, with the planning of Rock on and Rocks at Sea. APS is the company that did our 3D printing for us, and then South High School actually machined some test parts for us for part of our payload. Um, so with that, um, I will take any questions that you have, but thank you all for coming. And I'm only about five minutes over, so I did a pretty good job, so clap for me, yeah. <laughs> all right, so does anybody have any questions? And Mark, if you wanna turn the lights on so we can see each other. I like it dark in here because you know this gets washed out so easily. Questions, anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nope, because that would all be in the SD card that cracked. <laughs> so, so what we had is from the Rock On people where they all just ran that one kind of Geiger tube. So we have that. So in terms of the difference with the shielding and the different kinds of tubes, that that should all be on there. And we still have the crack thing, so maybe at some point we'll find a company that will try to do a recovery. It doesn't look that bad. It's not cracked all the way through, but I guess just in the place that it's cracked, they don't want to try and touch it. Um, now, that this, now that the couple companies have, have uh, decided they don't want to do it, Ryan and Bob have started talking about, well, there are videos online you can see of people doing this. Maybe we should try it just because just we don't have the data anyway. Might as well try it out. So, um, But we might try a couple more companies and see if they're kind of brave. It seems more like... They don't think it's worth the risk trying to do it because most of these companies will only charge you if they recover the data. Right? So I think they're, they're just pessimistic enough that they don't want to bother. I think it could be recovered if somebody actually did it. But, oh well. And most of the team members were very nice to the one who cracked it when they took it out. I won't tell you which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, you can ask Sarah later, she knows. <laughs> it was not you, no. Any other questions? Do you know what any of the other experiments were on that? Oh boy, so let's see. Uh, Temple was one of the ones that was actually using the ports on the side of the rocket to collect atmospheric samples. Uh, I can't remember what they were doing with them. Something about the composition on the atmosphere. Uh, Puerto Rico ran theirs again, a, an updated version. Um, I should mention that with all the risks associated with this, after doing it for about a decade, every single single one of the rock and rock sea, rocks at sea rockets has come back recovered. Um, and only, they've only lost one rocks at X rocket, and that was the one that launched last year. Um, so I know Puerto Rico, their uh, experiment that inspired Ryan that particular year, they didn't actually get any data because it crashed in the ocean. So <laughs> they were running it again this year. Um, there were some teams that did, some of the Rocksat teams did basically outreach um, kind of focused payloads where they basically did mini rock on for middle and high schoolers and put that up as their payload. That's something I've actually thought about doing here in the future because that might, it might be easier to get the, the funds to be able to, to do something like that. Um, for some of the other Rocksat ones, because the skin comes off, um, they really try to stick things outside of the rocket. And uh, Rocksat X is easily tens of thousands to maybe more to actually do a project like that. So a lot of them pair with industry partners. So like aerospace, company, aerospace companies have technology they want to test. And so they sort of say, we'll fund your project and give you the technology. You design and build the rest of the payload and just test it for us and give us the results. Um, so there are companies that are building like different uh, lightweight booms that stick out. So things that might ultimately make it onto some sort of manned space flight if you need to extend something outside of the vehicle. So like they just stick these things outside of the, the Rocksat X, not even with anything on, on them right now, just to sort of see, do they actually extend? Do they break? Right, things like that. So there's a wide, a wide variety of the different kind of science that they do. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, you go on to the catalogs for the companies that supply for like lab supplies for biology labs, basically, and they have they have like the DNA kits. Like they send you a little thing with sort of standard instructions for how to rehydrate and stuff like that. So you know, it's pretty simple and not terribly expensive. Like on order hundreds of dollars for the DNA for this. 
altogether, including like the testing supplies and all that stuff before and after. It's not, not so bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because it was something easy to test, right? So like we also discussed, you know, maybe sending it out the DNA to get sequenced, but this was also an easy test, right? Black light glows, yeah. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Well, students remember to go apply for the undergraduate scholarship for this year. Pretty easy way to get money. So make sure you talk to me about that. All right. And otherwise, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh. And on your way out, don't forget to take a look at the rocket up here. And I put up their poster that they presented uh, the Roxette C team at uh, Research in the Rotunda this year as well, if you want to take a look at that. So that was actually before the launch, but has some more info.